we are live. Welcome to Luke Cage Season 2 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything MCU leading up to and including this season. As a white guy, I realize the N-word is not for me to use. I will not do a black scent. I won't speak in abonics or quote lines that are not for white people to repeat. I won't refer to non-white people by names that they express they don't want used. And I will not be criticizing religion in this video. So, diving right into the season opener. Episode 1, Soul Brother number 1. So, this was a really great season opener, and I really loved the opening scene, Luke hitting a drug place, and he's annoyed that they insist on shooting and listening to the awesome song on his device. And... Reverend James, played by Reg E. Cathy, R.I.P., talks about how people see Luke rehearsing the sermon in the mirror. Christianity is a huge part of the African-American experience. And let's see. I quite like, you know, in, in Pop's Barbershop, I, I'm terrible with the, the names. Uh, I believe... Yeah, it's it's D Dub and then the the ah uh, the elderly man. You know, D Dub points out he's far from the first black man to embrace black people being famous, and the elderly man points out Malcolm and Martin were spreading the message, not getting rich. And. I like that Claire is helping Knight with the, the physical therapy, you know, it's... Doctors say that doctors make the worst patients. I think, right, like, um, let's see, the worse, the higher. So right below that would be just stubborn people who really struggle to accept that their situation is now different. So, Knight needs someone that, you know, has the, the, someone who's really good with, with patients, and, you know, it helps a lot that Claire is someone that she already knows and trusts, you know, they've been in life or death situations together. Now... And, yeah, Claire and Luke talk about that Luke has a brand. And they have sex both showing lots of skin. So that's, you know, yeah. Is, is there a thing if it's both male gays and female gays? Bi gays, maybe? And... Yeah, there's some conflict between Luke and his father, Reverend James. Luke can't forgive his father for not coming to the prison to tell him his mother died. And, yeah, I I really appreciated the, the relationship between Luke and, and James. And Mariah, a powerful woman who isn't ashamed of sex, tells Stephanie, who she renames Billy, countless black people have been given new identities by the powerful. Historically, it's tended to be white, white powerful people. But Mariah doesn't actually want to make things better for black people, so she's happy to continue what white people did to her ancestors, even though she could go against it. But but yeah, you know, tells Stephanie, the new hostess, to work it. And... Yeah, I, f I forget exactly who it was, but, but one character says the line, Legal loopholes, they're going to make America great again. Which makes a direct comparison between Trump and an organized crime person whose name isn't Trump. So yeah, I, I quite appreciated that. Another thing I really appreciate, with Shades, Mariah remains sexually active into middle age. And, yeah, it was it was very cool when Luke gets into the truck, which blows up, not hurting him, and then he's also immune to a Judas bullet. 
and Luke makes a very provocative statement to B-dub's cam uh, B -dub, D -dub, I think, so camera starting to get an ego which is not surprising but is a potential problem so yeah right off the bat like right in the season opener they set up that I mean I feel like that is basically his ego is his downfall for this season and it's really too bad there won't be a third season at least not not soon you know and yeah apparently it was basically just like creative differences and you know that is frustrating but that is also something that can really like if you you know making tv shows is difficult enough when everybody's on the same page if if everybody isn't on the same page it can really become a nightmare so yeah and let's see yeah, uh, I think Rittenhauer is the one who tells Luke he has to work within the law, and he refuses because of ego. And... Let's see. Yeah, you know, Bushmaster makes quite an entrance to the specific situation I'm going to talk about. You know, it's not the first appearance he makes in the episode, but... You know, he criticizes how the other guy runs the business, carves his eyes out with a knife, uses acrobatics, and reveals that he's bulletproof, taking over the business. That's, yeah. And Luke tells Mariah he can't be stopped to never threaten Claire again. She's frustrated, and the episode ends now. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that they... Because that is, like... As long as there's Judas bullets out there, you know, the it is really just a matter of time, a matter of planning. Uh, you know, yeah, you you really would think that it would work. That you know, when they when they blow up the truck, that you know, as as far as I understand, that wasn't really supposed to. I don't think they expected that to hurt him, but it gets him kind of focus on you know it it pisses him off so now you have a good chance to to shoot him with a judas bullet which you know if you just if he knows you're there and you have a gun you know there's some chance it's a judas bullet so you know he might be more careful but yeah and and it not working that means that you know it's it's good when you when you make a sequel to something to change the the status quo in a really significant way and yeah i i think they made the they made a really good decision to to do it with the did i i can uh that reminds right i didn't oh right i think it's here we go yes right um yeah Yes, so, if you have a show where the first season is very focused, then it can be really effective if the second season, or at least one of the follow-up seasons, really goes and toys with what is set up in the first season. Maybe characters that have a lot of power lose that power, or vice versa. Major character loses something that used to define them, has to come up with a new identity. And a short list of shows that do this, not all in season two. Prison Break, Dexter, Alias, various Star Trek shows, Burn Notice, Charmed, Two and a Half Men, Lost, Daredevil... Jessica Jones, and this also does that, you know, we have this, yeah, just, you can no longer stop Luke with a Judas bullet, and, you know, yeah, Bushmaster tries a couple of things in this season that also fail, even though you would think, yeah, you know, he, Stick managed to poison, poison him with the, with the smoke, in defenders but he didn't drown yeah i mean i mean it is also different like he did start to drown but then you know through sheer force of will he yeah but but yeah um taking away the thing that was set up in season one to make him vulnerable vulnerable and to instead of attacking him you know in season one 
yeah, for for a lot of it, they don't know they they don't really have anything that can hurt him. So instead, they try to go after people he cares about. And then in this season, that also doesn't really, you know, he he's alienating people. You know, so yeah, his downfall here is his ego, and it's very, very difficult. It's, it's, you know, if not, if seemingly nothing can hurt you, if most people look up to, that that you know in in your area at least look up to you, and the people that break the law. A lot of them are scared of you, you know, the, the, you know, potential partners are very attracted to you, it's, it's, you know, the, the reverend lays it all out. That is, it's, it's very difficult to not develop an ego in that situation. You know, he is basically a celebrity, <laughs> you know, which is also like, I mean, imagine if someone was running around saving people, like... Keep in mind, we turn celebrity, we, we make celebrities out of, like, you know, ridiculous, like, like, Elon Musk is a celebrity. When you, if you actually take a, uh, what's it called, objective, if you just look at the things he's done, the major decisions that he's made financially and such, he's really not some amazing genius. You know, the, 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 he's, he is, he is not a real life Tony Stark. He is a real life Todd from She-Hulk, you know, and, uh, I'm gonna, there's a, instead of, instead of me doing a bad job summing it up, I am going to just link to the, let's see, um, ah, what's his name again? Uh, th uh, Thought Slime did a really excellent video on just... Oh, right, he did a bunch of videos on Elon. I actually forgot about that. I, I was just going to link the one that he did about the Twitter mistakes, but... Huh. You know, I might just link to the, the search that finds a bunch of his... He did at least four different videos on him. That's that's not a great sign for Elon. That that kind of, you know there's the that's that's the equivalent that's the thought slime equivalent of being the main character for separate days. So yeah, the Twitter main character. Um, anyway, that is it for the first episode. Bringing us to the second episode. Straighten it out. So. Let's see. Yeah, the, um, yeah, Colleen and Knight together, which I, that was also really, really good. I, okay, so I think, yeah, the next one is, is Iron Fist season two. And then there's one more season left of Daredevil, Jessica Jones, and The Punisher. Can Colleen show up in all of those? They they already have great supporting casts, but man, she was it was very very fun to have her. Yeah, and yeah, you know, Knight doesn't want Rand's help. Considers it charity. She was a righty and lost her right arm, and Colleen does the tough love thing like she did with her students in Iron Fist Season 1. Let's see. Admires Knight, but doesn't pity her. Let's see. And, you know, the, the, ask her if she's thirsty and not for water. Rose had plenty of room for Jack on that door. Sure, but the movie showed that the balance wouldn't work. I do, I do, it's... I used to be very... I, I used to nitpick, like, just all over the place, but... And then I cleaned up after myself, but the... the it bothers me that people still, like... 
the movie made you feel feelings and you resent that so you try to say oh well you know um it wasn't even that good um because there was there was this particular problem with it and it's just like if you go back and watch the movie it's not a, the movie makes it very clear that there was not the balance would not have worked out even if there was room now Luke Cage followed the one guy, gets to Bushmaster's hideout. We get another badass action. You know, every action scene this season, it, both seasons are really great. Bushmaster tries to talk him into a partnership and shows how all the various weapons are powerless against him. Pistols, blades, assault rifles, a hand grenade. Yeah, and, and we see Knight and Colleen talk about what they do with a million dollars. And Colleen would go to this library, which Knight criticizes, she'd buy an expensive car. And it's like, I love reading. I think it's, the, you know, the, the medium of, of the, the written word can do things that no other medium can but a million dollars and all you're going to do is read? But, yeah, it's in character for Colleen. So, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm not criticizing, I'm not criticizing characterization. I'm, I'm saying, yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not, it's not like a cinema sins thing. I'm just saying that's, yeah, it's, it's not a bad thing for the show. And, yeah, excellent fight in the bar. I really love that at first it just seems like the guy is clueless. Like, he can't understand or won't accept that clearly they're not interested in him right now. But then it turns out Knight put away the guy's brother, wants revenge. I really love the thing, you know, he's like, you don't even remember me, do you? You put a... Um, yeah, something like, you put away my brother, don't you remember what he looks like? Something like that. And she says, I don't look in the toilet before I flush, which also makes Colleen chuckle and just, yeah. And when Knight struggles in the fight, because she forgets her right arm is missing, which I hear is typical for people who recently lost, you know, something we rely on so, you know, that much, an arm, you know, and and she looks to Colleen and she just takes a sip of beer. Like, you know, there's... And that's also great. Like, instead of her just, like, staring back or something. No, no, she, she takes a sip of... Like, if you've ever been in a fight, you know, like... There's a couple of things you really don't want to be doing during that. Sipping on something is one thing. Being drunk is another... Un unless you're going to do the drunken master thing. But, yeah, that's... <laughs> That's a pretty clear message that I just, what, I'm not going to help you here, you know, and just, yeah. And she does later join in the fight and helps fight dirty, tossing a pool ball. Honestly, that guy definitely had it coming, grabbing a wound from behind like that. Let's see. And we see Bushmaster prepare, prepare to fight Luke. I forget if it's this episode, but at one point we do see him using the natural materials. What you do is... You catch a fire, fire it up, corrupt, stirring it up, it's burning hot, drifting, hitting every slot with a drop kick, it's toxic. And we find out that Stephanie is a spy for Bushmaster, which is a great... Yeah, he, he really, like, he thought this thing through. It wasn't just, like, a, a spur-of-the-moment decision. He... he strategized before he started going after Mariah. Great discussion between Luke and Claire about racism, anger, what he should do. My culture's performance is excellent. There's much more anger and ego this time, but he makes it feel like it's still the same character. Now, let's see. You know, in, in season one, similar to Chadwick Boseman, R.I.P.'s T'Challa and Black Panther, this is a powerful African-American leading man who is not angry, quick to violence, but stoic, using violence only when it is necessary. It helps fight back against the harmful stereotype that black people are inherently more angry and quick to violence than white people. That's why the character was really angry in the original comics and isn't here. 
The stereotype was invented to prevent black people from getting equal rights. After all, if they're just unnecessarily angry all the time, how can you help them? When, in reality, the things that were said of black people, violent rapists, were true of white slave owners. You know, part of the first season was Luke being a good role model, a black man who's not constantly angry, violent, as goes the stereotype. This season explores his anger, showing the audience enough faith that it won't mean that we think that it means that all black men are constantly angry or violent. Luke hits the wall. You never had it all. I know a lot of guys don't seem to understand this. When your female partner sees you do something like that, she worries you're going to hit her next. And in, in this case, they do also have Claire say, you know, when she was a kid, there was abuse and violence between her parents. Let's see. And, you know, it, you, you immediately, when, when she leaves, which, you know, it, it's, it sucks, but that is the right to say, you know, if he, if he can't keep from hitting the wall, yeah, you know, eventually he might not be able to keep from hitting her either. And, you know, it's it, with with her leaving, you know, that makes him lose perspective even more. She did used to have a, a calming presence, but that's not, you know, you can't ask a person, especially someone who has experienced violence and abuse, you can't ask them to to make that sacrifice, you know, to to be afraid that they are going to be hit and just yeah. Let's see. And yeah, the episode ends on Bushmaster knocking Luke down. Which brings us to episode four. Wait, did I? Ah. Uh, huh. Did I accidentally skip? Oh, whoops. Yeah, I guess I accidentally... Huh. Um... I accidentally talked about episode 3 before episode 2. So, what I'm going to do here... I guess... Is just put in the... Yeah. I'm going to do episode 2 now, and then episode 4 afterwards. That's it. Yeah, so... Episode two, straighten it out. Before was episode three, wig out. So, let's see. Yeah. This is not the time for alternative facts. Love a scathing reference to the worst American president of modern time. It's not even 9.30 in the morning. It's 10 o'clock somewhere. And... Knight says to the rest of the people working in the room where she works from that regarding her arm, she doesn't need pity or jokes, and it does seem to work. You know, disability being a theme of the season. It's not my birthday. There's no funeral. What are you doing here, Mariah? What do you need from me? In the first season, Mariah did not seem to really care about anyone other than family, so it's interesting to see that her daughter is someone that she didn't take care of. And, yeah, you know, she basically abandoned Tilda the way that she would abandon the young people she uses as political props if they were no longer useful to her. And... Yeah, there, there was this kid who was clearly inspired by Luke's example to try to protect someone, but it didn't go well because the kid isn't as strong. Right, and Cockroach does have a gun that can hurt Luke. 
you want to help me, Claire, then stay out of my head. A lot of straight men struggle to accept help from other people, sometimes especially women, especially if the woman is close to them, like a partner, mother, daughter, that kind of thing. Not that I'm saying that daughters are responsible for the, you know, you're not responsible for your parents unless they're like, unless you're all they have or something, but yeah. And Luke beats Cockroach for beating his wife, even goes so far as to start choking him, but then stops when he realizes that Cockroach's son and wife are now scared of Luke, and the episode ends. So yeah, in the first season, Luke was very much a reluctant hero. Now he has a board where he keeps track of the heads of organized crime. He has now fully embraced it. Let's see. And... Um... There we go. Yes. So, episode four, I get physical. And... Yeah, you know, several of the cops are not bothered by Luke getting knock knocked down. And... Knight talks to Luke about Claire. He's reluctant to open up to people, probably feeling like, as a man, he shouldn't need to, but everybody needs somebody else. I really love Luke and Knight making references to aliens in Terminator 2, and not feeling like they have to, you know, actually spell out. They just say, you know, I, th I think Luke says that she looks like Ripley, and she's like, I was thinking Sarah Connor, you know. You know, we all know that those are the two movies that, you know, they're not talking about Ripley from the first movie. They're not talking about Sarah Connor from the first Terminator, you know, so, yeah. So, Yardies are inactive. So inactive. Really inactive. Welcome to the new place. It's a sad place. And, yes, I, I did consider singing it. You're, you're welcome. I decided not to. And... Yeah, Tilda figures out what Bushmaster did with what he bought from her. Nightshade. Luke shows up to ask her questions. She helps him, but ultimately does not tell him about the Nightshade. I love the line, everyone gets knocked down. The important thing is getting back up. And some backstory for Bushmaster, set to night. And the episode ends with Luke getting served, which was legitimately just very unexpected. Which brings us to episode 5, All Sold Out. S-O-U-L, not S-O-L-D. And... Foggy is still representing Luke, but seemingly Luke has to settle 100 grand. And we see Knight with her bionic arm for the first time. And I really appreciate the detail that, you know, you have this. She has to, um, did they say calibrate or something? I forget exactly, but yeah. And Piranha will pay Luke for an appearance and has a bunch of stuff that Luke has broken. And yeah, I, I appreciate that he points out how creepy it is. And Knight thinks back on a case. Scarf seemingly planted a gun to arrest Cockroach. Luke puts on the bulletproof hoodie and says, Ugh. it's like cosplay, you know, just really, yeah. I, you know, not that there's something wrong with cosplay, although I guess maybe Luke thinks so, at least in this season. But, you know, if you're actually a hero, you shouldn't be forced to, to cosplay. Foggy gets roundly ignored at the party, possibly a reference to the 2003 movie. And... And we get another flashback. Knight thinks back to when Scarf was basically testing to see if she would go along with being dirty and then pretended he was joking. 
Who the hell is Ray Ray? Uh oh. And Scarf blamed himself for Earl's death. They're doing a really good job with these flashbacks where Knight is realizing something wasn't the way she thought it was back when she thought he wasn't dirty. And yeah, Matilda does show up to the ceremony and the doors open and we see the three decapitated heads on spikes. And Piranha wants someone to shoot Luke. And guys with guns shoot at Luke. Luke saves Piranha, says the price doubled, and the episode ends. Which brings us to episode six. The Basement. And yeah, as the episode opens, we get more Warriors references. See, I would say that like the the people writing the show just really, really love the the movie The Warriors, but I guess it's kind of also that they're writing characters who really love because because like I think this was the time where someone actually put like three bottles on fingers and started clanging them together to to like you know for the for the what's the word like um intimidation effect like yeah they straight up just th these are characters who like that movie and you know this is a show full of characters who really love the pop culture they grew up with so makes sense and the guy would rather die than give up Bushmaster info. And Bushmaster is proud of the Mexican cartel style violence as the... I want to say, is it is it Tembi? I forget. I think it is her. And others in the bar disagree, including, I want to say, the, the uncle, Anansi. 48 hours or they send in the National Guard and ICE. I thought that was going to be a ticking clock, but... Was there actually... Because, like, Bushmaster isn't under control within that time. Yeah. Let's see. And, yeah, we learned that in Seagate, Shades and Shay were together. And Shades rationalizes it. Shay doesn't regret it. Very emotionally intelligent exploration of bisexuality... You know, something that we didn't already, always know is that sexuality, it is partially based on, like, the situation, you know. And, yeah, some people, you know, temporarily, you know, experience same-sex attraction. For example, when in prison and then reject that part of themselves when they get out and, you know, even feel guilty about it when that's, like, nobody should... The only people who should feel guilty about their sexuality are pedophiles. Let's see. In other words, an extremely low number, percentage-wise, of... The, the LGBTQ, there's there's way more, the, the percentages, like, if you're, if you're worried about pedophiles, like, you know, for example, Catholic priests, and, you know, a, yeah, a lot of white men, there's, there's, it's a lot more of an issue. Let's see, now... Very moving to hear Piranha's backstory. And Piranha's grabbed, brief blinking lights, very tense and very cool rescue scene. Knight is struggling, worried she'll become Scarf, quits. Which I also really appreciate, like, you know, it's not... It's not that Luke Cage is singularly, you know, easy to, to corrupt. It's that 
the idea that the law doesn't always pro protect innocent people, that can have a corrosive effect on your moral compass, you know, and even Knight, who is very by the book, actually almost, you know, plants a weapon to, yeah. And... Yeah, so Luke challenges Bushmaster, who agrees they talk before the fight. Bushmaster asks him to join. Great fight. I really appreciate that they move in different ways. It would be really boring if they didn't. And Bushmaster seemingly loses, then blows paralyzing powder in Luke's face, breaking the rules that he agreed to. Kicks Luke into the water, where he'll drown if he continues to be paralyzed, and the episode ends on that. I really like this detail that... He specifically did agree. I, f I, for I forget the exact phrasing. I think maybe they said no tricks or something like that. You know, no, no fighting dirty, something. And yeah, they actually, you know, and, and it's not really that Bushmaster hates Luke specifically. It's that Luke is an obstacle. The, you know, Luke is standing in the way of him getting to Mariah. And that brings us to episode seven. On and on. And yeah, so we get some flashbacks. Luke comes to, swims to the surface as the opening. You had one job. He has many jobs. Mariah talks about snitches, graduates from mad to stabby. Very cool fight. I love the gratuitous removing of the sleeve of the bionic arm. Like, they weren't even tr Like, someone grabs onto the sleeve and just, like, tears it up. Like, wow, that is just... They wanted to show it off, you know? And, and there's, no, there's no reason to be, like, demure and apologetic about that. Just, li like... Literally everyone watching wants to see the uncovered bionic arm as she's kicking ass. So just, yeah. Bushmaster had piranha fed to his own brethren, which is dark. And I really love Ridden Hour's monologue to Mariah with the, that's, insert name, shit. The, the whole, just, yeah. And Shay shoots Rittenhouse. Shay's, Shades shoots Shay says he loved him, and Bushmaster explains his name, the death of his mother, why he hates the Stokes family, intercut with Luke and Reverend James talking about Luke's mother's death, them blaming that on each other, and we end on Luke saving Mariah, her saying she wants to hire him, which brings us to episode 8. If it ain't rough, it ain't right. And, uh, yes, here we go. Yeah, the, the opening has Shade's understandably upset that he killed Shay, but he really did not have a choice. But yeah, I really appreciate that they do, like, really, the relationship between Shades, I, I guess I'm going to start calling him Comanche, because, like, yeah, Shades and Comanche's relationship gets a lot of exploration in this season with Comanche legitimately feeling like he should be allowed in with Mariah in the room when they're making decisions and, you know, just... And, and Mariah sending him away essentially like a pet or, you know, like a dog. Leave. And just, you know, no... Yeah. At the police station, Tilda is shaken, and thus shaken. Do you have kids? Are you trying to threaten me again? Oof. And Knight is in charge now that Rittenauer is dead. 
and Bushmaster breaks a chair at hearing that the Stokes are alive. Very intense. Trouble in paradise. Very cool when Luke stops the attempt at shooting the Stokes right outside the precinct. And Shades explains how he got the name Shades. I don't think I got it written down, so I'll say it here even though it's in a later episode. I quite like that when Shades is giving his confession, you know, he talks about how he killed Comanche, and then the, the, uh, I forget her name, but one of the higher-ups at the police station, you know, opens the door, and we see that the, the, or, or, yeah, Shades sees that Comanche's mother heard him say that without him knowing and you know this is after he lied to her face and said something about i i, I don't remember what exactly it was he said but he obviously didn't confess then and there you know because he wouldn't get anything out of that he he confesses once it can get him a deal and yeah you know the, um i've i've talked about how in reality it doesn't bring you closure to see the the you know if 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 someone kills someone you love it doesn't it it you know we think that it'll that it'll bring catharsis and closure to see the person who killed die you know such as witnessing their execution you know i'm i'm talking like the the kind of ah what's it called them them being them being executed by the state. But, uh, you know, yeah, state-sanctioned murder does not actually provide catharsis and closure, even though a lot of people, we, it's like we feel in our gut that's got to be what that would do. But it does bring a lot of closure to hear the person confess like that. So I really appreciated that. And Knight points out it's usually a friend who kills you in the life. Cool action at the end of the episode. And Tilda wants to counter Nightshade. Very clever thinking. And they call Danny, ask for a favor. Which, you know, at first I thought, oh, so he's going to be in the next episode. He does show up, but not the very next episode. You know, that's actually the when he um, he lets them use a building. Of his. Which brings us to episode 9 for Pete's sake. And yeah, so the opening is they arrive at a Rand building and Mariah needs a phone after Knight took hers, looks in rooms, no luck. And you know, there's one, but it's not plus it's it's not like ah, what's it called? Cause cause yeah, you know, it's not there's she finds a landline, but it's not like plugged in properly yet or something like that you know but she does get one from reverend james you know manipulating him into showing her pictures of of luke when he was younger and namdi goes to bushmaster tells him where to find mariah and mariah tells tilda at least some of the truth about who she thought was her father the nickname Black Mariah was something she was bullied with. That's why it upset her when Cornell called her that in season one. Well, yeah, that's redundant. He's not in season two. Let's see. And Mariah opens up to Tilda about the rape, and we find out that Tilda was Pete's son with Mariah. Mariah was forced by her mother to give birth to a rape incest baby very relevant as abortion rights are stripped and while that wasn't quite as bad when this episode first aired as it is today the fight to like the the republicans have been fighting tooth and nail to accomplish that for quite some time now and it was very clear that they weren't going to stop until the it was extremely difficult to get an abortion in America, so, yeah. And the raid on the club leads to nothing, because Nandi warned them. 
Bushmaster and his people attack the Rand building. We get some really badass fights, physical and with guns. And Reverend James feels that all the good things in Luke he got from his mother. Many times when a father and a son have a troubled relationship, it's because the father feels that he has put the bad parts of himself into another generation. You know, if, if you're in a relationship where you're afraid that your male partner is going to leave and abandon his children, you know, try to talk to him about that and make him, you know, if, if, if that is how you feel, try to make him realize that the, you know, he did put some great parts of himself into the next generation. You know, and if you're a young man watching this, if you really have these concerns, try to if if you if you have a partner and you're not in an abusive relationship, try to talk to her about it, because something that you know it's we we guys are way we gotta get better at at realizing things like this. If if you just stop and you know take a step back and think about it logically. A lot of women, the reason that they have children with, you know, if, if, if a woman intentionally gets pregnant with, you know, yeah, from, from a man, then it's very free, you know, as, as opposed to, uh, you know, um, uh, sperm donation, you know, if, if a woman intentionally has unprotected sex that leads to pregnancy with a man a lot of the time not always but a lot of the time it is because she sees something in him he might not see it himself but she sees something in him that would make you know um that she wants to br to to bring into the next generation you know the um there are some women who don't think that much about it but a lot of women you know they 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 don't just decide willy-nilly now and you know obviously if you decide you're not having kids at all that's also completely okay now yeah and, and Bushmaster talks about his ancestors that's where the heads on pikes came from and he had one of the little grenades with him, blows up the car. I was getting a real vibe of, like, season one of Daredevil with Kingpin in, in the, you know, and just talking about his past. So I appreciate that it did at least end differently, although in both cases the the criminal is able to escape, you know. But, but yeah, it's not that there was someone, he had someone on the inside and Shades reveals he has Bushmaster's uncle, and the episode ends. Now, that brings us to episode 10. The main ingredient. And the episode opens several people, some black, some Jamaican, criticize Luke's actions. And Danny guests, and he's written consistently. He takes off his shoes. I, I was a little worried that he was gonna also take off his socks, but I guess you know by now he has come to the, yeah. And he sits in the barber chair in the more relaxed way that he's known for, etc. D Dub is the first person who likes the name the Immortal Iron Fist because Danny still tells everyone who will listen. Power Man and Iron Fist, it's got a ring to it. I see what you did there. Let's see. And the lawyer explains why Mariah has her money back, and she literally busts his balls. Very cool fight between Nandi and Knight. Badass as Danny and Luke take on the nightshade growing place like a duo and it opens with a really cool long take and the, the patty cake bit was great and afterwards they nuke the site from orbit. I mean, they burn the building down. Only way to be sure. 
and Danny finally admits that money is power. And Mariah now does go by Stokes. She and her people shoot a bunch of people at Gwen's, including Stephanie, and she burns and shoots Bushmaster's uncle to death. And back at Harlem's Paradise, she had them put up the Biggie poster, and she's now wearing the crown as a Biggie tribute is played in the club, really underlining, yeah, that's, she is the queen now. And Danny says Claire was worried and sent Danny, which is, that is a, a clever way to explain that very low-key ending of episode as Danny and Luke talk about the dragon. And that brings us to episode 11, The Creator. Bushmaster's badly injured, and we get a flashback to Kingston in the 80s. We see younger versions of Cornell, Mariah, Bushmaster, Mabel, Uncle Pete, the Stokes lawyer, the professor, and Marianne. Very easy to understand why Bushmaster hates the Stokes. And Mariah gains access via biometric. I gotta say, when I saw that, I thought, oh, someone's gonna cut off her hand and get in that way. But ultimately, the door, as thick as it is, Bushmaster still manages to break it down. And we learn that Bushmaster and others were given an injection at age 11. Bushmaster was the only one to survive. It sounds like either they injected them with something dangerous to study the effects or possibly an intentional attempt at eugenics. And, you know, either way, like they said, you know, oh, they, they paid us, they gave us food, and they said that it was a vaccine. You know, yeah, it's obviously they knew that it could hurt the them and yeah you know sadly that is something that has been done to minority groups you know injecting them with something that was either thought to be or even known to be dangerous without telling them you know don't get me wrong obviously if you're like if you're in a situation where you legitimately just you're okay with being injected with something that might be dangerous or that you that is known to be dangerous but you're like in a in a place where you feel like well as long as it can help them study the effects as long as it can help develop a cure you know obviously as long as consent is respected that is you know at, at the very least it's a it's a different discussion you know, arguably, under under the right circumstances, that can be acceptable. But without consent, completely unacceptable. No discussion to be had. It's, it's monstrous. And we get a f another flashback. Two years later, we see Bushmaster given the nightshade for the first time. We see that the story was told to Luke by Anansi's partner, Ingrid. And I really appreciate, you know, so, so yeah, the... the um, Anansi was responsible for the first time that Bushmaster was given the nightshade. I, I realize I could be calling him John MacGyver, but he specific he expressed that he wanted people to know him as Bushmaster. You know, if if I were talking about Muhammad Ali, uh, hold on, am I thinking of the right person? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be calling him Cassius Clay and, you know, saying, you know, Malcolm X. Yeah. And the, the but, but yeah, you know, Anansi was responsible for the first time Bushmaster got the, the nightshade. But he thought that it was basically the, actually, yeah, he, he deduced rightly that it was the only way to save Bushmaster from the bullets. And I think it's noteworthy that basically, like, you know, it's, it's, I'm not sure Bushmaster was conscious enough to realize what was being, what was happening during it. But afterwards, he, you know, he wakes up and he's like, I thought I was shot. How am I still alive? And, you know, it was explained to him, Anansi took you here, you got some nightshade. 
and thus you survive being shot. In Anansi's mind, it was a last resort. It was, you know, you, you maybe do it once, but it's just, I mean, he, he's already, this, if, this is after his mother died, isn't it? If I recall. So, you know, basically, the, the, yeah, you know, Bushmaster is the only, you know, Anansi by this point has lost, ah, uh, let me think, was it the, was it the mother or the father? I, I'm not entirely sure, but he lost one of his siblings and the, the sibling's partner and now could lose the, you know, the sibling's kid as well. Like that's, you know, just this is, this is literally the only living, you know, yeah, the only living person still th th alive other than himself of the, the, that sibling of his yeah, he, he needs to keep Bushmaster alive. And once Bushmaster finds out, Nightshade means I can survive getting shot. He thinks of it not as a last resort, but basically just as part of doing business. You know, he goes out there not hoping to avoid getting shot, but intentionally taking bullets in front of witnesses the the ones firing the guns, I mean, and, you know, spreading the message, there's some, you know, Bushmaster can take bullets, and he's coming for Mariah, you know, so, the, the, yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that entire, very, very, very cleverly conceived, and that is also, you know, essentially, that it, that is a generational thing, you know, a lot of the things that, um, ah, what's the word? A lot of the things that the baby boomers and such would say you should only do a little bit because it might be dangerous. You know, us younger generations, uh, you know, my, myself being uh, an elder millennial, you know, we we might think, no, 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 we can we can do that all the time. You know, kind of, and it is. There is a um, a lot of baby boomers. You know, some of their circumstances meant that certain things were actually potentially dangerous, and they struggle to accept that today some of those things are no longer dangerous. Nah, but but yeah, you know, here obviously Anansi had it right. Like, you should not be indulging in Nightshade unless it's absolutely necessary. Right, and I also, I like that we see in the, in the, the first of the flashbacks, even when they were younger, Mariah was already, like, treating Bushmaster badly. You know, she, let's see, she, yeah, because he's, like, listening in on this conversation, and, you know, seeing that his, ah, is it his mother is being treated with no respect from the other, you know, higher-ups in the, in the crime family. Or, or the, yeah, the higher-ups in the other crime family, I mean. And, you know, that's already making a strong impression on him. And then Mariah shows up and says, do this thing for me. If you don't do it right now, I'm going to tell someone that you're listening in. You know, she knows she has the power. And it doesn't make her, you know, she doesn't have empathy for him. Even, the, like, I mean, they're essentially, they're, the, the, um, they both have black skin, you know, or, or dark, ah, crap. I forget what the proper term, uh, you know, but, but yeah, African-American and Jamaican-American and the, um, yeah, she still sees herself as above, you know, and we also see even as, like, she's got to be like a teenager or something, even back then, she's, she thought she was above other black people, which, keeping in mind, I'm not saying that there's, you know, black people should not be beneath anyone, and they certainly, there's no proper evidence of, like, you know, all, all the, the, you know, what's it called, phrenology and all these ridiculous, you know, 
pseudoscientific ideas of trying to prove that they're genetically inferior or something. Black people are not inferior to white people. No group of people is inherently superior or inferior based on DNA or... You know, well, I guess if you get into, like, the, when there's, like, incest, sure. But that's, you know, if, if you want to go there, that's, that's... As far as I understand, there's more... There are more white communities that have engaged in incest than non-white. But, yeah. But, but yeah. I'm not saying that anybody should feel that black people are below anyone else. But Mariah, a black woman who knows that some people think less of her because of her black skin, does not, you know, it didn't, it didn't make her more empathetic towards other black people. It doesn't make her think, well, we black people have to stand together, stick together, and fight the people who say that we're lesser than them. No, it makes her relish being able to feel above someone with black skin, you know, so that's a, a really great characterization there, and it's not, they don't spend forever on it, it's, it's fairly brief, we don't see her very much in these flashbacks. And Mariah imagines Mama Mabel and Uncle Pete working through some issues, and the growing conflict between Shades and Mariah comes to a head, and... Shade starts killing Mariah. We don't see her much during it because it's not necessary to show. Now, you know, we, sh we shouldn't be focusing on, you know, oh, she's, she's in so much pain, it is, uh, you know, because it's not... The pain of women is extremely important, but there are so many movies and TV shows that go out of their way to show as much of it as they can, and that by itself doesn't do good. Now, the... Ah, let's see, what was the other thing with the... Uh, right, right. And again, note that it's actually... It's when she brings up that he and Comanche you know, were together in prison. The, the, the shame that he feels, you know, Comanche didn't, but he, you know, clearly Herman does feel shame over their relationship, and it push, uh, yeah, he's, he's triggered, like she was when Cornell once again, if this is the first of the videos, I'm I'm not using triggered in a derogatory sense. I'm using it as you know descriptively. When Cornell said that Mariah wanted Uncle Pete to to rape her, you know she was triggered and killed him. And here, her man is triggered by. You know, it's basically, he he feels shame, he doesn't want anyone to know about it, and so, you know, temporarily he loses, you know, self-control. And, you know, some, some part of him feels like, if I kill Mariah, then no one will know. No one, you know, because he feels like he has given up part of his masculinity, he, he is no longer as good as he were before, back when he were only straight, you know, not bi. And, yeah, I, I, you know, he goes tonight and lets her arrest him so that they can take down Mariah. And, let's see. I, yeah, I appreciate Bushmaster thanks Luke for keeping Ingrid safe. And the episode ends on Sugar going to Luke. Which brings us to the penultimate episode, Can't Front on Me. And yeah, so we see the, the Bushmaster drug, and it's like bath salts. 
and Mariah is working with the Chinese drug guy and the United Nations becoming a kingpin. Bushmaster falls for the trap, but Luke helps him and we get some more badass action. We live and die by our rep. Well said. And Mariah sets up a free concert when Luke says he won't protect her anymore. And Tilda tells Bushmaster how to get close enough to kill Mariah. And Shade's wearing a wire to take Mariah down, but she realizes it and, you know, gets them into the... Um, what's it called? Yeah, the room that's biometrically sealed. And, you know, like, yeah, how are the how are the police going to get in there? And at first, you know, Knight is also like, do we even know where that room is? And Bushmaster uses the entire syringe on himself in a single, yeah, very cool action with Bushmaster versus Luke, Bushmaster versus Luke and Knight together. And Shades gives Knight the 38, and she arrests Mariah. Luke says it's not over. And that brings us to the season finale, which I quite liked. Cold. They reminisce over you. I appreciate that. I, I forget. I th I want to say it's the lawyer. Yeah, yeah. It's before. It's before Mariah starts giving a speech. The lawyer points out that Mariah is a soror of the um, the the judge. You know, and and we've seen the. You know, she's appealed to that before. And, yeah, bail is denied, and she is sent to Rikers. And uh, Mariah makes reference to climate change, and the judge, you know, says she resents the Katrina comparisons. And there's a 75% rise in crime. I like that when Luke walks in, there's still smoke rising from the bullet holes in his hoodie. And, let's see, so, uh, let's see if I can decode my own notes here. Right, Knight and Tilda talk about Bushmaster and Mariah. And Shades claims that he wants to help Luke and suggests he should be king. Luke, not Herman. And in jail, Mariah is attacked by the, the, ah, um, what's it called? I want to say the, the, um, yeah, some of the, some of the Jamaican, uh, you know, so, so they're in league with Bushmaster. But she's defended by someone who feels that Mama Mabel didn't do right by her. And so she kills that person, so she's in charge. And let's see. And yeah, Luke attacks. I want to say it's the Italian, the female boss of the yeah. And in order to get what he wants, Luke snaps some fingers, not his own. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and, Mariah, you know, basically wants everyone who isn't protected, not, not only Shades, but everyone who isn't protected by, like, family and, and such, family relation wants them all taken out in preemptive strikes, including Alex, not even, which, which I, you know, I, I, he's not a character we've necessarily noticed that much because he doesn't say or do, you know, he essentially acts as the, the right hand of Mariah. Like, he very rarely makes a decision on his own 
or like acts have we ever seen him act against her i don't think so you know i i, I don't know i guess she would say that he's acting against her when he's trying to survive here at the end but yeah, you know, that shows even, and, and that was actually the, the moment that she said everyone who isn't, everyone who isn't directly linked via family or, or that kind of thing, and, and Sugar's wife, because she gave her clothes and she'll never forget that, you know. But immediately I was thinking, even Alex, even the guy who has always been there for her, who has never, like, no matter how bad the situation is, he's kept his cool. He has protected her as best he could. Yeah, even him. And, and you know, he runs to um, Tilda and, and says, tell your mom I'm not going to snitch, you know. And, yeah, there's, there's just no... And I also appreciate, you know, we see Alex's mother really distraught over that because... At the end of the day, you know, that is one of, it's, when you kill someone, you also take them away from their loved ones. And, let's see. Sugar explains, and Shade survives an attempt on his life and talks to Mariah one-on-one. -on -one. And Mariah and Tilda talk about the the rape, and I really appreciate it, you know. So she basically explains, you know, the only way to make it after a rape is, you know, part, part of you has died, and that part can't feel anymore. So, you know, and, and it's true, there, there are a lot of people who, it's difficult to make generalizations, but some people really try and can't love the the rape baby other people it's you know it's the other way around but yeah and i i quite liked that you know i mean mariah kept telling tilda you are a stokes you know she when when Tilda goes to Cornell's grave, which I also appreciate that we didn't know whose grave it was. I, I thought it was going to turn out to be the grave of... Actually, come to think of it, I don't know if... Do we know if the, the woman who took care of her... I forget her first name, but it was something Johnson. I'm not sure if if we have been told that she is dead. But But yeah, you know, Cornell actually did take care of her, and... Yeah, I mean, he saw a lot of Uncle Pete in her, probably, and he missed Uncle Pete. He he maybe liked Uncle Pete more than Mariah, and he blames Mariah for, you know, and it really, like, the, sto the story of Cornell was legitimately tragic, that he, he wanted to be, uh, he, you know, he wanted a proper job, and... Mama Mabel insisted that he be part of the family. But, but yeah, you know, Mariah has told Tilda over and over that she's, you know, she's a Stokes. There's no running from that. And in the, the last, you know, the, the very last thing that Tilda does with Mariah when Mariah is still alive is she kisses her with the, the poisoned lips and... You know, I kind of realized before it happened that that was what... But they didn't wait forever to reveal that that was what happened. So it was fine. You know, I, I didn't feel like they were... You know, and I don't know. If, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of media where someone plots to kill someone else in a, in a very stealthy way. So the moment, you know, we see her mixing something... And then, actually, I forget if we see her applying the lipstick, or maybe we just, it cuts and she's wearing lipstick, and then, but yeah, you know, I, I definitely, and, and yeah, it's absolutely true, like, if you know what you're doing, you can definitely mix a, a potent poison from natural resources and form it into, for example, lipstick, and basically... All she has to, she just has to make sure 
that she wipes it off before she like eats something or something, you know, and, and don't be like super obvious about being uncomfortable with it. And yeah, you know, when she kisses Mariah on the lips, like at some point Mariah, you know, we don't we don't think about what we lick our lips all the time. Like it's just yeah. And yeah, and and I like Tilda singing. You know, she sits down at Cornell's piano, which she also inherits, and yeah. She she sings this in in all of the two seasons. That's actually the first time that a character has sat down and performed a song about the situation that they're in. But yeah, you know it again. It shows a lot of intelligence. You know, she, it's not like she can. Go, she's not gonna if she goes to like a priest or a therapist or something. That person might you know contact the authorities if if she actually sits there and confesses to a murder but she has to get it out she can't just have it in there and and just driving her mad so she expresses it let's see and shades is arrested now that you know the deal is void because mariah can't you know, and, and Knight says, no, 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 you alienated your lawyer before she could explain the fine print. Let's see. And... Yeah, Tilda says, the last Stokes just died. My name is Johnson. And she wants Mariah cremated and says, I don't care what you do with the ashes. You know, don't... Don't give her a nice mahogany, you know, f uh, um, casket like, you know, because because yeah, the the um, the lawyer has handled all the, the you know we, he was in the flashback, he he's been their the attorney for the family for say, yeah a couple of generations I guess, and yeah he he takes care of the they've always had money so there's always been money for extravagant funerals. And I like that D-Dubs call, you know, he's, first he calls Luke, Luke Corleone, and then he calls him Luke Trump. And he buys Pops and says it has to remain Switzerland. And I like that as, you know, as he realizes that Luke, his idol, is not staying true to who he was you know, he is wearing this t-shirt that says Hero of Harlem. Luke Cage Hero of Harlem. So he's, like, it's, he's wearing his, he's wearing it, you know, usually you say on, on your face or on your sleeve. He's wearing it on his shirt, on his chest. The, the, you know, I, I really love it. Because he's been wearing his own merch throughout the season, you know, possibly last season certainly throughout this season but the, you know a bunch of them say different things but that he was specifically wearing one that says Luke Cage hero of Harlem when he doesn't think that of him anymore and Luke inherits the club and Mariah told the uh, the lawyer Donovan you know, it'll be a, like a siren for him. It will change him. And first Luke says, burn it to the ground. But ultimately he does start using it. And we see the biggie crown. You know, at first it, it takes a couple of, of shots. You know, at first he's, he's like, is this really gonna, you know. But yeah, ultimately we get the shot where the crown of biggie is over Luke Cage's head. And, you know, he does take down the, the Biggie poster and put up a martial arts poster. And, yeah, you know, he still calls himself the sheriff. Knight says, you sound like a dictator. And the tater's just because I like you. And, yeah, you know, Knight will take down Luke if he, you know, goes against the the yeah 
and the door closes on her just like in, in Godfather. I, I really love when, you know, ultimately the series of shots, it's not difficult to replicate. I love when the people replicating it mean it. When when it's not just, ooh, look at what we, you know, we watched that movie too and we, we really liked it. So we're going to, you know, the 4400 was a show that had its ups and downs, but it really did not earn the Godfather reference there. And this show has earned it. And I would really... it. I guess it's not impossible. A, a season three, a, a story following up on this would be extremely interesting. And... You know, in, in comic books, there's a lot of stories where heroes become villains and vice versa. And... Uh, let's see... Yeah, and there's, um, you know, the person performing is rapping about Luke Cage. And, yeah, you know, it's, again, ego, you know, this is, this is basically as high as his ego could go, you know, he's not going to leave Harlem, so becoming the king of Harlem is basically as high as that could, yeah, and... Sugar shows up and asks, you know, about Claire, and and uh, I think it's I think it's Sugar. It's certainly someone that he you know he trusts. And Luke just says, "Tell Claire to go home." And in the final shot, Luke breaks the fourth wall, which is a first for the Marvel Netflix show so far. So, yeah, it, very very interesting and. Yeah, it's it's really too bad that there's it's it's very clear that they had some ideas. They they there were things they were intending to do with season three with with Luke to to be ending it like this. And some people really didn't like it. I felt like it made sense as a way to, to you know it's just. I don't think we've really, we hadn't seen it in the MCU before this point. Someone actually becoming, like, I, I suppose an argument could be made that, you know, Tony Stark should have been more careful and not create Ultron. That was definitely, there's definitely some ego there. But he did realize it, you know, as, as soon as, as soon as Ultron started, you know, threatening and, and hurting people, Tony was like, okay, we got to shut it down. Whereas Luke, there's a lot of situations where he could, you know, if he just, if he stopped, took that famous step, step back and looked at what he's doing and what it's causing, he'd realize this is just, you know, he even actually, yeah, I guess he does with, when it's, when he almost kills Cockroach, he does stop short, you know, but, and, and ultimately, you know, it's not like he's going around like killing a bunch of people. But he does go extremely far, and just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so that is it for my own notes. So I am going to get into some critic quotes. But actually, yeah, just real quick, I will say. So I am... Yeah, this is my updated ranking of all the Marvel Netflix shows, Marvel Netflix seasons. Worst to best, I love all of them except for Iron Fist Season 1. So, worst to best, Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, The Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Luke Cage Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 2, and Jessica Jones Season 1. Now, on... Yeah, so on the, um, yeah, Metacritic does not distinguish between seasons and the score, so that one's not quite as interesting, but the, if you look at the Rotten Tomatoes, let's, oh, that's right, yeah, for some reasons, 
for some reason, it does not have any critic ratings for season two, but the audience score is 68% based on 1,294 ratings, where season one had a 67% audience score, based on 338 user ratings. That one was certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, with a 90% score based on 72 critic ratings. And... Right, so... Let's see. Yeah, various critics say that the season is too long, and yeah, I gotta say, you know, so far, The Defenders is the only of these that does not, you know, where the season isn't longer than it really should be. I've, you know, like I said, I, I love almost all of these, but I really, it's too bad that they didn't really, they, ha they struggled to get, yeah. Meanwhile, D Disney Plus MCU shows, you know, it's a struggle to get them past six episodes total. So they end up, you know, too short a lot of the time. So, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. Uh, one critic said that he wished that Bushmaster and Luke had teamed up sooner and for longer. And he found it frustrating that they left let Mariah go, which just served to prolong the season. And... That is true. Like there were several times over where it really seemed like okay, that's that's going to be it, but yeah. And he expressed that he felt the plot was repetitive, the the subplots especially. Luke Cage did a 180 turn from season 1. I don't know that I agree with that assessment, but I did see multiple different user reviews say it, and I think it just, it felt natural to me the way that he gradually, like, his ego, you know, he, he got increasingly out of control because of the, yeah, his ego. And I think it's important to take characters in interesting new directions. I think it would have been extremely boring if it legitimately just was. You know, I guess I could just briefly... So, so yeah, Luke Cage, season two... You know, season one, basically just, you know, a great role model. You know, and then season two, his ego really takes control. And he develops this ego because so many people are looking up to him, you know. And, uh, let's see, yeah, Jessica Jones, you know, season one, she's struggling to, to deal with Kilgrave, and then season two explores, you know, she, there, there are situations where she could, she might lose alias investigations, she might be evicted, you know, and she has to confront this issue that, you know, some people think of her as a misanthrope, as someone who just hates all people, and she doesn't feel that that's her. Daredevil season one, he, you know, he manages to take down the Kingpin, even though at first no one will even say the name Wilson Fisk. And then the, you know, season two, he struggles with this idea of, you know, might I go too far if, you know, and under the, under specific circumstances. Let's see that. Yeah, that's those are those are them. Those are the other, the other ones have not had more than one season. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, the the user said Bushmaster's interesting, but he's pushed aside for Mariah and Shades, who are both boring villains. Another user reviewer said there's nothing unmotivated in the entire season. The ending is not silly like it was in season one. You know, when, when Diamondback and Luke fought physically at the at the very end. Uh, this user reviewer said that it's true that it starts out in a slow pace, but it's a good thing. And, yeah, he, he gave Season 2 an A-, minus and Season 1, I think, an A. Uh, yeah, because he said it was... It only went down by one degree. I, I'm not, you know... 
here in Denmark, we don't use that. We use a different scale to, to grade, you know, school stuff. So I'm not very used to that. But I think, I think that's how it works. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I think. Yeah. So I have some other critic quotes. And, hmm, okay, here we go. Luke Cage Season 2 succeeds when it's introducing new, new elements into the tired superhero genre. Luke's sudden fame is dealt with in ways I've never seen in a superhero movie or TV show. He's a minor celebrity, and the public loves him until they don't. All it takes is one knockout from Bushmaster for Luke's adoring fans to suddenly turn on him. This rings true to life. Fame is more often a curse than a blessing, and today's superstar is tomorrow's tabloid headline. For reasons that can't adequately be explained beyond an inherent cruelty running through everyone's bloods, fans sometimes seem to revel at the downfall of their idols, especially if said idols are relatively related to reality television and that's essentially what luke cage is he is a reality tv star a personality a presence luke struggles with his fame and he also struggles with ways to pay the bills most superheroes are inherently wealthy or we never hear about their financial issues at all super strength aside luke is a normal working class guy who needs to make ends meet now let's see Right. In the comics, Luke became a hero for hire, someone who offered his super services for pay. This may seem a bit mercenary, but it's also fascinating and a topic other superhero pro properties don't dare touch. Luke Cage Season 2 dabbles with it, although not overly so. In one episode, Luke, strapped for cash, agrees to be paid to appear at a mogul's party. He's told that all he needs to do is work the crowd and take a few sel selfies. But things turn dark quick. Guests nonchalantly smash beer bottles over his head just to test how impervious to pain he is, and when Luke angrily reacts by grabbing the bottle-smashing rich boy around the neck, the crowd reacts not in horror, but adulation. They circle the scene to take photos. Things only get worse when the party host opens up an auction in which the winner gets to shoot a gun at the bulletproof Luke. This is dark, different stuff. Superhero properties don't dabble in this sort of thing, and to see it portrayed here is refreshing and absorbing. And at least one user, reviewer, or critic said, I love the cameos from other Marvel Netflix. Same here. And yeah, some of, the, some of them did say, too many complex ideas to examine for one season. It does not have room for all of them. And I, yeah, yeah, I think that might be, might be true. And that is... All that I had, yeah, let's see, that's all I had written down, maybe if, ah, there we go. Ah, let's see, is there anything that I can think of? I, yeah, I don't think I said this video, I absolutely love the musical guests. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. Yeah, um... I, I really, really hope that they do bring back Luke in, in some, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, the fact that all of Marvel Netflix is now on Disney Plus does not mean that Disney intends to do anything more with these characters other than Daredevil, which, you know, yeah, I, I understand why that's. A lot of people's favorite. My my personal favorite is Jessica Jones, but I do understand that not everybody feels that way. Um, and certainly, it's difficult to get her. It's it's easier to Disneyfy. I guess not. Maybe not Disneyfy, but MCUFI Marvel Netflix's Daredevil than Marvel Netflix's Jessica Jones. You know how how do you how does how does Jessica Jones fit into you know they they don't really like literally both 
seasons of Jessica Jones that I've seen so far. I haven't watched season three yet, but both of them are about this really intense personal trauma, including sexual trauma. That's really not something that you see a lot of in the MCU. I mean, Tony Stark used to be idolized, even though he was consistent, like... Let's see, at least in the first two solo movies. Uh, I guess maybe not in the third one. No, yeah, yeah, in the third one, in the flashback, you know, he's he's characterized as someone who, you know, has sex with women he barely knows. And, yeah, you know, that that's not the same thing as rape, obviously, but... It's very clear where the, I mean, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, th I think I have said all that I had about that, but, but yeah, um, yeah, hopefully at some point they will, you know, bring back the, the Marvel Netflix properties, but, you know, if it's, if it's not already being planned, I guess it might take a number of years before they get there, and there are a lot of comics, Marvel Comics properties, that they already really want to do, so, yeah. I think that is... Um... Yeah, so, I'm really going to miss this show. I really, yeah, that is it for this one. Now, I intend to record the review itself of the Luke Cage show, spoiler-free review, fairly soon. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.